Hello and welcome to the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Bester and I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Hammer. Tonight we're thrilled to celebrate Maggie Nelson's new book, On Freedom, Four Songs of Care and Constraint. Before we start the program, I just have a quick note for the audience. Um, please note that this program is being recorded and will be available later on the Hammer channel. This program is a Zoom webinar, so we can see your names and anything you type into the chat or the Q&A boxes. And we'd love for you all to introduce yourselves in the chat box and maybe tell us where you're watching from. And the Q&A box is where you type in questions you have for our guest speakers. So now on to tonight's program. Maggie Nelson is a writer who is sometimes a critic, a poet, an essayist, a philosopher, a memoirist, a scholar, or really usually all of these together at the same time. She's a serious scholar of critical theory, philosophy, psychology, feminist and queer theory, cultural and art criticism, the history of the avant-garde and aesthetic theory. In a 2013 interview in the literary blog Bookslet, Maggie was quoted as saying, I need to talk back or talk with theorists and philosophers in ordinary language to dramatize how much their ideas matter to me in my everyday life. And she does this brilliantly. In her writing, she applies her scholarship and her crystal clear intellect to make sense of real everyday life in all of its uncertainty, challenges, and joys. Her 2015 book, The Argonauts, is now widely regarded as one of the defining literary works of the 21st century. The Argonauts was a New York Times bestseller and was awarded the 2015 National Book Critics Circle Award in Criticism. And in 2016, Nelson was awarded a MacArthur Genius Fellowship for, quote, forging a new mode of nonfiction that transcends the divide between the personal and the intellectual and renders pressing issues of our time into portraits of day-to-day -day lived experience. Nelson has published a total of six nonfiction books and four books of poetry. I think that's prior to tonight. I think tonight is the seventh. Um, and we've been very lucky to have her speak at the Hammer six times since 2007 with many of those books. And tonight is the seventh. And it's really such an honor to have her here tonight on the first day of her book tour for her new book, On Freedom, Four Songs of Care and Constraint. The book was released just yesterday by Grey Wolf Press, Press, and you can order a copy online right now from the Hammer Bookstore using the link in the chat, or you can buy a copy from your favorite independent bookstore. On Freedom breaks down and examines the concept and consequences of freedom seeking to extricate the word from the conventional political trappings associated with it here in the United States. Nelson takes a philosophical approach to examining the concept of freedom through four distinct lenses, sex, art, drugs, and the climate. She's going to start off tonight's program by reading a passage from On Freedom, and then she'll be joined by fellow writer Hari Kunzru for discussion. Kunzru is the author of six novels, Red Pill, The Impressionist, Transmission, My Revolutions, Gods Without Men, and White Tears, as well as a short story, short story collection, Noise, and a novella, Memory Palace. He's also a longtime journalist with The Guardian, Time Out, Wired, and Wallpaper, and he's the host of the 2020 podcast, Into the Zone. Kunzru was born in London and now lives in New York City, where he is tonight. He's an honorary fellow of Oxford University's Wadham College and has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the Coleman Center at the New York Public Library, and the American Academy in Berlin. So after Maggie and Harry, Harry have a conversation about On Freedom, they'll take audience questions live via the Q&A box in Zoom. So now I am so thrilled to welcome Maggie Nelson to give her first public reading from her new book, Freedom. Please join me in welcoming Maggie Nelson. All right, well, I see that you all are here. I can't see you. I can't, I can't uh, entirely feel you, but I'm going to believe that you're here and that we're here together. I'm really thrilled for the Hammer for hosting this. Um, again, even though we're on Zoom, it feels like a hometown event. Um, I'm in Los Angeles, um, as is the Hammer, and um, I'm just really grateful um, to them for hosting, and I'm really grateful for to Hari for um, agreeing to be in conversation tonight. We were in conversation back in April about Red Pill, um, which is so great, and um, uh, I felt like it had a lot of overlaps with this book while I was reading it, even though I was very jealous that he got to explore his ideas in fiction, and I had to use this um, coarse articulate tool of um, discursive nonfiction. So with that said, I'll read a little bit of this book and 
Um, I will read uh, just the opening a uh, few pages and then we will talk. And then if you have questions, uh, we'd love to address them. And uh, like many people that I know during the pandemic, I lost my eyesight. So this is my inaugural event for my book and my inaugural event of needing to read with glasses to read to you. So here I go. Um, so this is from the introduction and uh, yeah, there's nothing really you need to know. It's an explication of kind of how I came to the project. So um, it's in little sections and the first section is called Stop Here If You Want to Talk About Freedom. I had wanted to write a book about freedom. I had wanted to write this book at least since the subject emerged as an unexpected subtext in a book of mine about art and cruelty. I'd set out to write about cruelty and then found to my surprise, freedom coming up through the cracks, light and air into cruelty's stuffy cell. Once exhausted by cruelty, I turned to freedom directly. I started with What is Freedom by Hannah Arendt and began to amass my piles. But before long I diverted and I wrote a book about care. Some people thought the book about care was also a book about freedom. This was satisfying as I too felt this to be the case. For some time, I thought a book on freedom might, not, might no longer be necessary. Maybe not by me, maybe not by anyone. Can you think of a more depleted, imprecise, or weaponized word? I used to care about freedom, but now I mostly care about love, one friend told me. Freedom feels like a corrupt and empty code word for war, a commercial export, something a patriarch might give or rescind, another wrote. That's a white word, said another. Often I agreed. Why not take up with some less contested, obviously timely and worthy value, such as obligation, mutual aid, coexistence, resiliency, sustainability, or what Manolo Callahan has called insubordinate conviviality. Why not acknowledge that freedom's long star turn might finally be coming to a close, that a continued obsession with it may reflect a death drive. Your freedom is killing me, read the signs of protesters in the middle of a pandemic. Your health is not more important than my liberty, maskless others shout back. And yet, I still couldn't quit it. Part of the trouble resides in the word itself, whose meaning is not at all self-evident or shared. In fact, it operates more like God, in that when we use it, we can never really be sure what exactly we're talking about or whether we're talking about the same thing. Are we talking about negative freedom, positive freedom, anarchist freedom, Marxist freedom, abolitionist freedom, libertarian freedom, white settler freedom, decolonizing freedom, neoliberal freedom, Zapatista freedom, spiritual freedom, and so on. All of which leads to Wittgenstein's famous edict, the meaning of a word is its use. I thought of this formulation the other day when on my university campus, I passed by a table with a banner that read, stop here if you wanna talk about freedom. Boy, do I, I thought. So I stopped and asked the young white man, probably an undergraduate, what type of freedom he wanted to talk about. He looked me up and down and then said slowly with a hint of menace, a hint of insecurity, you know, regular old freedom. I noticed then that he was selling buttons divided into three categories, saving the unborn, owning the libs, and gun rights. As Wittgenstein's work makes clear that the meaning of a word is its use is no cause for paralysis or lament. It can instead act as an incitement to track which language game is being played. Such is the approach taken in the pages that follow, in which freedom acts as a reusable train ticket, marked or perforated by the many stations, hands, and vessels through which it passes. I'm borrowing this metaphor from Wayne Custombaum, who once used it to describe the way a word or a set of words permutates in the work of Gertrude Stein. What the word means is none of your business, Custombaum writes, but it is indubitably your business where the word travels. For whatever the confusions wrought from talking about freedom, they do not in essence differ from the misunderstandings we risk when we talk to one another about different about other things. And talk to one another we must, even or especially if we are, as George Oppen had it, no longer sure of the words. So I think I'll stop there and then Hari and I can just talk.
Hi there. Hello. Hi. Um, oh, this is such a pleasure. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Congratulations Harry. on so the much. book. Um, and in your introduction there, I mean, you mentioned the context we're in, which is the context of the pandemic and, and the pandemic has has made some things about freedom really starkly apparent, you know, particularly that freedom for a lot of people involves freedom from having to care about others. And I noticed there is a sort of sly subtitle that your book has, which is songs of care and constraint. I mean, and that I think is a sign of the sort of book it is. You're 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 interested in the complexity of these of these things. But so I'd like to talk I'd like to talk about the kind of notion of freedom. You know, maybe regular old freedom is what we should start with. <laughs> the, but the right has a notion of freedom here that is a kind of disinhibition, uh, mm -hmm. a kind of, I, I think you quote Wendy Brown at one point mm -hmm. saying that it's, they've managed to make their politics seem like they're about freedom and fun. Mm -hmm. And conversely, casting the idea of care and the idea of sort of, uh, of, of interrelationship mm -hmm. as being uh, about regulation and repression and, and, and a kind of policing of, of people's freedom. Um, and how would we go about um picking that and where you know do you see a do you see a way beyond that very very sort of uh, fixed set of positions i know you'd start with a real softball sorry yes yeah, sorry <laughs> to go straight into the, the, the no, like, yeah, can it. you solve all our problems making yeah, just no, I love it. no it's great i mean i think that the turn about freedom and fun that you talk about from wendy brown you know was really um a point of interest to me in th this book, because I think that, um, you know, you, one has to chart these uh, fluctuations closely because the, these these um, rhetorical changes, like when I was growing up, uh, there was this, I mean, it was kind of disingenuous, but there was this kind of idea that there was like, you know, the button down Christian moralist who was angry at the freedom and fun. And I think that, you know, Brown makes the most uh, articulate case that I know of, of kind of writing about the end of the 60s um, being a kind of um, first the success of making the 60s seem like they were licentiousness and, you know, a kind of, you know, outrageous disinhibition that needed to be contracted. But now we're in this new phase where, as you say, or Brown says that there's a kind of um, new alignment, uh, whether it's, you know, via the Proud Boys or the Capitol riots or, you know, with the Trumpism about disinhibition, freedom, freedom to say whatever you want, you know, no, no, as you say, um, you know, I mean, which is, of course, you know, capitalism has been a bloody carnival all along, you know, this is not a new thing. So in some sense, when I say you have to chart the fluctuations, I don't think it's like it was this and now it's this. I think it's that each, I think it's like each decade almost, I don't know how fast it moves, um, you know, political entities figure out how to harness new moments. Anyway, that's all kind of uh, historical. I think in terms of the now, I think you're being very canny because I think I asked you the same question when we talked in April, <laughs> albeit put differently. I asked you what strategies the left was going to bring to this new alliance of authoritarian statism with freedom and fun. And you had really good answers. So I wish I could turn it back. But I wish I could remember them. <laughs> right, exactly. I think I wrote them down somewhere. But um, uh, I mean, I think that, you know, I don't have a blueprint of action, but I do think that my book was just, it was starting to notice, as you said, this freedom care binary. Um, and part of what I wanted, you know, why I wanted to talk to you is how much work you've done in podcasts and in writing just about the kind of, um, you know, the, the kind of uh, just fruitlessness of wishing away complexity via binaries. And I think that the binary about freedom and care, you know, maybe this is kind of sleight of hand, but the way I approached it was to say that there, um, one can enact a kind of freedom that is, as you said, um, the freedom from having to care for others or the freedom of being in relation, the freedom of being in mesh, the freedom of your actions having uh, impact on others. But, you know, I think that, uh, I think it's an illusion. I mean, I think it's not, it's not true. I think it's like a defensive formation essentially, you know, and I think that once it's kind of understood like that, um, uh, 
and, and once enmeshment is understood as a kind of given and that that's one possible reaction to it, kind of to its pains and to its difficulties and to its messiness and to its frustrations and to its lack of power that it, I mean, it, it taking away people, you know, what people um, have as forms of power via whiteness or other things. So I think um, a lot of the book is spent trying to not have freedom and care be put in such a rote fashion in opposition. I think people of all kinds find uh, care troubling and coercive at times, you know, on a spectrum between that to being, so I don't think it's something, I mean, I, the, the book also spends a lot of time troubling care while also, you know, advocating for things that would fall under a politics of care, but not wanting the term to become the kind of um, blanket ethical goodness under which we all travel, presumably with no um, resistance psychically or otherwise. You know. Anyway, that was a long answer, but. But yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, you 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 hit on something really important. I think somewhere in the book, you 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 write that it's possible to feel free, maybe mm-hmm. without actually being free. The mm-hmm. kind of libidinal pleasures of this disinhibition. Mm-hmm are a kind of consolation prize there mm-hmm. for, for all the ways that in in, in fact uh, people are leading deeply coerced yeah. lives. I mean, obviously, you know, again, another warning that you, you give in the book is, is, is about the difficulties of accusing others of false consciousness or, mm-hmm. or of, of, of not being aware of their, of, of the truth of their own situation. But it does seem relevant here in that the more kind of performative the the sort of the flag waving kind of freedom gets the more you suspect that there's a sort of deep anxiety that underlies it i mean you know you you started off with aaron hannah aaron you you said and i mean and she is very suspicious of this idea of a kind of personal or inner freedom you know it's without a freedom that's guaranteed in in the public realm i mean it's very difficult in america to argue about freedom because it's sort of for many people it's a kind of given like you know it's it's like you know this is america ergo in the idea of america their freedom is is sort of you know bolted on to that and so sort of mm-hmm. trying to trying to say trying to talk about the ways in which um we are not free in this in this place is very is very kind of complicated and difficult Mm -hmm. um but yeah i mean the other the other the other thing that that came up in your in your sort of first answer there is about being enmeshed as a given i mean it's not it's not that you know we are constrained now and we cut the bonds and we go off Mm -hmm. into this realm of freedom that's not actually a possibility you know for, for anybody even the, even the most sort of mm-hmm. i don't know singular libertarian mm-hmm. character is is enmeshed with others in in some way mm-hmm. um but i don't you know i'd like to go back to the generational thing i mean you brought up you brought up that the the kind of uh the starting point of the uh you know they are the repressed mm-hmm. conformists. We mm-hmm. are the the freedom uh, mm-hmm. loving, mm-hmm. Um, countercultural uh, uh, characters. Mm-hmm. And as you say, that that kind of you know the freedom of desire. If that was the kind of cry of 1968, the mm-hmm. terms and conditions of that have 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 changed. You know, that's turned into this kind of very reactionary disinhibition. Mm-hmm. And it is it is a book that the. I mean, I hate to sort of kind of reduce things to sort of these these generational tags that we always use as, as short as shorthands. But there is, it's a book that seems very aware of the shift over over time of mm-hmm. of ideas about freedom. Mm-hmm. And I'd like you to talk a bit about um, sexual freedom mm-hmm. and about the things that you say about sex positivity. You know, there's a there's a suspicion at the moment of sex of sex positivity as being a kind of uh, Trojan horse for a kind of commodified sexuality, and you remind the reader that sex positivity came about against the backdrop of AIDS and against against a very particular kind of uh, of moment. Could you say some more about I don't know about yeah sex in the eighties maybe? <laughs> um, yeah, it was like 
just about my time. <laughs> um, I did the math. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff in what you just said that I wanted to pick up on. Um, I think that uh, in the introduction, I have this quote from David Graeber, who, you know, really sadly passed away while I was writing this book. And he has this quote about, um, I wish I could find it right off the top of the bat, but I, I don't want to get it wrong. But it basically had to do with, you know, um, and this is back to the false consciousness thing about living as if one were free, you know, instead yeah. of kind of um, grim dedication to a future um uh, future notion of freedom. And I think it's it's really complicated. I mean, because of the issue of false consciousness, like you say, like the, so my book was really interested in um, really taking up the challenge of what, what he's talking about, you know, because we have our one life and like, if, and, and, and like I say in the sex chapter, if you kind of um, get intoxicated with the idea that, you know, everything that you do or that we do collectively together that is liberatory, if it doesn't, um, you know, if it has an undertow, if it has a dark side, if it doesn't uh, reap successes, if it seems to have backlash, if we backslide, you know, that the temptation to think of it as, um, you know, this kind of uh, mirage and failure uh, can be so strong that we begin to tell ourselves stories that I think really, really impoverish our, you know, our, our lives and what could be possible in the present and for the future and, you know, for the past. All, so all that said, that, that chapter really takes up um, not that there isn't reason, as you say, to fear sex positivity as a Trojan horse or how you put it as, you know, a commodification. Like it doesn't, my, my chapter doesn't really say that nothing like that has happened or is happening. It really asks a different question, which is like, what are our investments in that story and what parts of our lived erotic sexual lives are we not able to, um, you know, uh, expand, fully embody, be with, ask questions of, explore if we're, if, uh, when we have these stories that we're, um, you know, that we're kind of, like, it, like, it's, it's as if all of our sex lives take place in, like, the pages of, you know, you know, some, some, journal with dueling op-eds or something. And I, and, and I don't think that's true for us, right? <laughs> it's not true for me anyway. So I, I really wanted to have that chapter be a, a, a call to, um, to something else being possible because like what, what kind of what we're already doing being possible um, and having more possibility in it. Um, that's different from the question that you ended with about AIDS. And I think that um, this is the chapter or the part of that chapter that did the most kind of, um, I don't know if it's obligatory or if it's, um, you know, dull or what have you, but kind of, trying to understand how one's own um, uh, how one's own sexuality is formed by the environment one grows up in and how um, the the, uh, the language around uh, around insisting upon desire and its possibilities in the face of those who would want to um, uh, imprison you for it kill, you know kill you or, or or that the act itself would kill you was very much. The, the, the scene of becoming, you know, of my, of kind of ages like 15 to 25. And so that was really um, important to me to return to the conversation because I think in addition to a discourse about harm reduction and harm and its relationship to sex, that I think the HIV epidemic has had a lot to, to teach us and to teach us now in current pandemic. Um, it also was a time of, uh, you know, pretty virulent, um, uh, sex wars and disagreements and agreements and alliances and coalition um, building and rebuildings between feminists and queers, gay, you know, lesbians, gay men, uh, trans folks, uh, straight feminists, you know, a lot of different things and a lot of, and a lot of things that were really ugly and a lot of things that were really beautiful and that some of the conversations that were haunted by now vis-a-vis -vis Me Too or whatnot. They're, they're not, to me, they don't just have a straight line into just the history of feminism. The history of feminism intersects in a really important way with the history of um, queers and, and gay history, and especially during that time in terms of the discourse about sex and about what was possible. And I didn't want that to fall away from the conversation with the kind of heterosexual um, you know, monomania on the dismalness of, of, of the way that things continue to be, you know. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, we're of a similar sort of age, and I and and I definitely came of age in the in the shadow of this moment. It felt it felt that a kind of moment of sexual freedom had been experienced by a you know rightly or wrongly had been experienced by an older generation, and then that was kind of cruelly snatched away just as I was about to enter the sexual arena, and and uh, um, and in, and you know instead my sort of sexual coming of age came up was against this backdrop of mm-hmm. of of death and mm-hmm. and and of and of of danger and of inhibition so you know being uh yeah that sort of positivity was not was not just a kind of consumerist positivity it was as there was a defiance there and that gave it a politics even i mean i think even for 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 straight people but primarily for mm-hmm. for gay people i think um but the one thing I was struck by is that you say that in your dealings as a teacher, maybe with younger people, you mm-hmm. you find that the the cultural memory of that moment has faded. Mm-hmm. And what do you think the consequences of that are? I mean, you know, are we part of a sort of yeah. a kind of you know, yeah. is there a very sort of determinate <laughs> group of people who have this have this relationship to sexuality that is just not shared by people who who came of age later? I mean, on the one hand, that's great, right? I mean, there's I mean, no- yeah, right. I mean, who who that's wants to have that? There to lament, it? and I, I think that um, I'm also haunted. Uh, that is just randomly coming to mind and pretending like we're not with 451 participants but like I keep thinking about some rant my grandfather once I could hear him being like she's never heard of Dean Martin she's never heard of Frank Sinatra and I just thought what is what is he eat like what is with him and then when I kind of do the math of what he was ranting about it was like as far away <laughs> from uh me in time as you know right. uh, you know so I think that like and, and to me that all might have been like you know like was that on par with Shakespeare was like you know Frank Sinatra <laughs> did he live with the Neanderthals like I was you know it was all like a uh, you know it didn't make sense uh to me that that would be something I should know about my only point with this is is I think as a teacher one has to be very wary of just that you because you knew about something because you were growing up it doesn't mean that um, it is something or has to be something that people um, coming up know about. That said, I have, have of course, made it a kind of, um, because I'm so interested in it and because I did um, uh, come up in it and because so many people like Sarah Shulman and her recent work on ACT UP and so many people who've been doing such good work kind of, you know, uh, to to begin to historicize and really take account in a, in a, in the kind of fashion that, um that, that, that a longer period, you know, I don't, I don't know, um, you know, oh God, 40 years, maybe, you know, 35, 40 years might give, I think that um, it seems like, you know, I'm, 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 I'm committed to continuing to, to teach it, but I also think I'm committed to teaching it. Um, um, I mean, it should be said that HIV absolutely exists and is a cause of suffering. So that, that should be said, but I also just want to say that I would I continue to teach it because I think that the kind of, um, the really difficult, like it was not pleasurable, you know, and I didn't even, was not, as I say in my chapter, in no sense in the thick of it, but that really difficult feeling that like, I may have done something, not just that I'm ashamed of, or not just that I half wanted to do, or not something that if I hadn't had a third drink, I wouldn't have done, but something that might take my life, you know, Um, that form of regret and panic about harm, it just really, um, it's a it's a lot and and I think that my book is uh, about the fact that that's it's not I mean we're talking about that you know about HIV in particular but you know it is part of the human condition in general you know my book does talk about the way that I think in the afterward I say something kind of pithy but but true meaning that like um I'm talking about the kind of Buddhist idea of certain lessons that may be our greatest teachers and it doesn't mean that they end in our survival. And I kind of say in the pithy line is I kind of say, it sounds like life itself. Like it's the great teacher that doesn't end with our survival. You know? <laughs> and I, I think that the whole book is kind of haunted by that. Um, and, and, and trying to, I mean, that's the, 
whether it's on a species level or a planetary level or on an individual level, that's the staying with the trouble. That's mm-hmm. you know, it's the Donna Haraway phrase. That's so hard, you know, so hard for, for, for everybody and so painful. So the book is really suffused with that in each chapter in a different way, you know. I'm got to, this is, there's now a sort of bifurcation. I want to ask about Buddhism, uh, but, but I think I might kind of park that and, yeah. and carry on with sex for, for <laughs> a moment. Um, and, and, and say that there is a kind of freedom that's associated with with a particular idea of sex, which is which is a sort of idea of sort of a liberation from certain sorts of coercive power relationships. I mean, there is a there are many models of what a kind of good sex could be, but among those, I think quite dominant at the moment is one that one where. Uh, sex is somehow free of power or mm-hmm. free of, of 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 relationships of subjection and domination of you know in some way you know sex is a kind is a kind of you know in the, we we bring the wider society into the bed and we enact our, our uh, a kind of you know our situation of being enmeshed in power relations in in the bedroom and you're very skeptical about about that as a as a horizon um and could you yeah, could talk a bit about about power and uh, about what you see as a, the as a I don't know I suppose is danger the right word of of a kind of mm-hmm. almost instrumentalization of sex as a kind of something that could be kind of good or ethical mm-hmm. or therapeutic mm-hmm. or all these kind of things. Yeah, you know, in the books. Uh, Actually, maybe it's in the sex chapter. Maybe it's an air reduction. I can't remember. But you know, this the, you know, for for some it may be very retro. But for me, Foucault is very always on my mind and very current. And I, um, I like I say, in one part of the book, I I do spend some time with um, you know what to me it was always a very powerful formulation of his that I probably read you know uh, you know a hundred years ago. But that is but this book really still takes up, which is that there's a kind of, um, you know, he has kind of a spatialized idea about um, freedom, about like, and, and this is why, this is what I said about freedom coming up through the cracks of cruelty stuff he sells, is that like in cruelty or in situations of domination, subjugation, you know, that the, that the space to move um, is, is constricted by domination, you know, and Foucault talks about, you know, it, it, it becoming so, and there are different degrees, right, till it becoming so, um, tight. I mean, he, he even goes all the way to like, um, you know, that the, the the enslaved that could only take the action of you know, you know, homicide or suicide or you know, like the, like like that being the kind of you know ultimate of dominated situation and choices left, right? Um, you know, in the sex chapter, I kind of try to describe how we don't, um, we don't, we don't. Sometimes we do, some people do live there, right? With that little, you know, there are are instances whether they're in interpersonal violations um, or whether or not they're in something like, you know, uh, rape employed as a mass weapon in a, in a war and, you know, um, but in my chapter, I'm focusing a lot on, um, this, I keep doing this in my hands because I'm very interested in like his idea about about degrees, you know, and our and, and how good we can become at kind of judging the degrees because it's kind of you know it's 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 both judging our options in the most you know noxious of ways. Like, can I get out of the room? Is the door locked? Is how big a creep is this guy? Okay, so that's like one way. But the other way, which is not as noxious, is um, you know, I think I want this. I'm not sure I want that. Oh, I was touched here. I don't know if that felt good. Maybe it did, you know, whatever, like a kind of different set of, of, of choices and decisions and reaction and action. And I think there's a long way of saying that I wasn't so much interested in adjudicating in that chapter, how much power should there or should there not be in sex, but to say that they're always like the, 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 this space that we're in is always, you know, the freedom and constraint are always in this dialectic. And um, and some of those forces are outside the room. Like if you're in Texas right now, <laughs> a lot of forces, a lot of, you know, freedoms too have just been radically diminished and are in the room with you um, with certain kinds of sex. Um, so there's different things that can be in and out of the room. And then there's stuff in your own head, you know, stuff in your own head, stuff in your own body. And that chapter, the chapter is really just fat, interested in 
a call to being alive to the interplay of all these freedom froms and freedom twos, and also not necessarily, um, uh, you know, trying to see the choices and the uh, that we do have, so that we don't feel and uh, w- w- when the power is not overwhelmingly dominating, we don't have to experience it as such. Um, in that anyway. I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the, the Foucault passage that you quote in the book, you know, he says power relations are possible only insofar as the subjects are, are free. You know, I mean, it's not, you know, a subject and, a, and an inanimate object. It's this kind of interaction presupposes a kind of, you know, even if, you know, even if the degree of freedom for one person is tiny in the sort of situations that you've, you've described. But um, you seem suspicious of, 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 of what you call a, a, the moralistic stance that clings to a singular conception of power and blocks experimentation with power and its many forms. I mean, that seems a sort of Foucauldian yeah. position. You know, I mean, he yeah. was somebody who was very famously interested in, in uh, BDSM uh, practices and, and um, you know, that was part of his sexual identity. Mm-hmm. Um I mean, and I mean, maybe this is this is mischaracterization. I get the impression that you think we are at the moment, this kind of particular moment that we've become, uh, we've we've swung towards a concern with freedom from various kinds of mm-hmm. coercion, as opposed to freedom to do mm-hmm. things we want to do sexually. And you know, maybe at other kind of recent historical moments, we've been, you know, the discourse has been more concerned. You know, with things like yeah, mm-hmm. and, and and sort of libidinal exploration. I mean, would you think? Would you? Is that your feeling about now, right now, twenty twenty one? I put it quite like that, just because it seems a little, a little reductive. Yeah, like a little reductive. I think that, um, I think all the conversations about the freedom from, and I tether some of them uh, to me too. You know. Are, are absolutely crucial, you know, and like have to be happening. And I think that, and I think that in my chapter, what I want to, um, I want to add to, I want, it's like, it's accretive, it's not displacing, you know, it's accretive to say, um, there still isn't a long archive or discourse, especially of women being sexual subjects who are willing to be um, to take on all of the weight of what comes with that, which involves agency, uh, regret, uh, whatever, just a million things. Um, it, you know, it, it involves being a subject who's not innocent, you know, as none of us are all innocent, you know, which doesn't mean you're, um, that there aren't perpetrators of terrible things. It just means that um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a willingness to, to, to be a subject in a, in a discourse where, um, certain presumptions about a kind of innocent of desire, innocent of many things are, are, are not, th- are not there. And I think that that's really, it just still is very bedeviling to place that because of the anxiety to place that front and center because of the anxiety that it will displace, um, you know, the, the, the freedom from discourse. And I just think that they, they have to be done simultaneously, you know, I mean, you, you, you mentioned Wittgenstein at various points. It seems like you know, there are different language games of freedom going on. There's a sort of juridical language game around consent and around a, a, around rights, which you know, in which which you have to you have to uh, is you know enormously important. And and, uh, and then there's a, there is something separate about agency and and becoming a subject and so on. Yeah. I mean, in those. You know, it's it seems it seems that part of the unpicking that we have to do is to know when one is one is bleeding in into the the other. I mean, there's a similar shape to some of your conversations, your discussions about art in in a way. Maybe this isn't this is a kind of I'm trying I'm trying to overlink. I'm trying to be mm-hmm. slightly too clever. Maybe I'll just maybe I'll just let's let's leave leave sex and then talk talk about art on its own rather than trying to trying to kind of muddle them all up. But you talk about, uh, I mean, you know, the classic modernist notion of art is to do with shock, and you've written about cruelty in art, and you've written about art that that um, you know aims to, you know, aims to destabilize or, or or confront or you know even more extreme things to the audience or the participants in in, in the past, but you make a kind of a sort of broad brush narrative say that this modernist 
moment has been succeeded by what you call the reparative turn, the the idea that art maybe is a, 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 is something that can fix what is wrong with us um uh i can't remember whose whose phrase was the orthopedic aesthetic mm -hmm. you know that in some way art is, is, yeah. right art, art is the thing that can kind of we can bolt onto our situation and can do something to improve us mm -hmm. and that clearly is in 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 tension with the aesthetics of shock or, 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 you know, or, or, or in any notion of challenge, you know, so um, say a little bit more about that. Do you, do you think that's a kind of periodization? Is that, is, is that a straightforward, is a, is a sort of, you know, a historical moment that has changed in, in our feelings, thoughts about art? Is, is different kind of art being made? Yeah, I mean, I think I wanted to write that chapter in part because like you say, I just, I had, the last critical book I wrote, which was published in 2011, was all about um, kind of my own looking back on um, as a as a teacher and as a you know liver and as an artist and as a you know on a century, the 20th century, very transfixed by um, the transgressive and and aesthetics of shock. And I, um, the art of cruelty, was an attempt to take account of 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 some of that via some figures, you know, that I kind of. Um, kind of have had a love-hate relationship with um, Arto, Francis Bacon, um, others. So I think that um, this chapter in some ways, like you say, was a um, it was an extension of that uh, historical critical project for me. However, we're only in 2021, so it's not like a lot of time has passed, you know? So I think, but I did think that there was enough that seemed changing, um, that it was worthy of revisiting um, some of the categories I'd put into play then. I guess the only thing I would say about what you said was that I think you said that, um, you know, is there a tension with an orthopedic aesthetic about shock moving to one of care? I think in my chapter, I'm, I, I, I characterize the, them both, um, you know, an aesthetic of shock and an aesthetic of, of care. Um, I, you know, I characterize them both as, as orthopedic uh, ideas and by orthopedic, you know, right. like that you can all imagine, like something that sets something right that that is wrong. But as I say in the chapter in the 20th century, the discourse circulated more around the idea that the audience were kind of you know uh, bourgeois putzes who were like dead, dead to dead to revolution, dead to living, dead to, you know, and needed to be awoken and uh, radicalized um, or or just terrorized if you couldn't radicalize them, and then. A lot of that has been um, replaced by the by the by a discourse around an audience that is, um, you know, uh, been harmed and damaged and is in need of care and um, repair. Um, so I think those are both orthopedic aesthetics. I I'm, I'm interested in watching this all happen <laughs> um, uh, more than yeah. So the chapter kind of takes some. Um, it, it tries to kind of offer a genealogy of how the word care, which has been operative in certain philosophical circles and feminist circles. Um, the and, ethics of care is very... Yes, like, very exactly. Important. Like there's uh, how it's been operating in a lot of spheres for quite some time. And then I, and then I kind of trace, I think it, it's like um, emergence into the art world, which I think now it's pretty, is, is fairly endemic, you know. I mean, would you say that, you know, if there's an aesthetics of care, is that is that in some way the same as the sort of relational aesthetic, you know, mm -hmm. when we have, you know, mm -hmm. cooking meals in the gallery and kind of, you know, face to face mm -hmm. encounters and so on? Is mm -hmm. that is that part of, of, mm -hmm. of this of this turn, if, 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 mm -hmm. if turn there is? Yeah, I think it can be, you know, I mean, I think there's there's a lot that. Um, <sighs> God, this is, a big, this is a big topic. I mean, there's a, there's a lot that that can travel under that name. I mean, I think um, maybe actually I, I had circled in big letters what is ethical sex from your last question that we didn't get to um, about the sex chapter. But I yeah, think, feel free to go back to that. Yeah, I mean, no, but I think everybody'd everybody like to know. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, as I see that question here circled, I, it makes me think that you know through very important conversations and the hammer is no stranger to them. Um, there's kind of two different big conversations. Like uh, there's what's, 
what's kind of what are the what are, what, where are the ethics in art like in art practice mm-hmm. and then there's the kind of the big question of like what are the ethics that need to be applied to the institutions of art museums curators um sales but you know art fairs you know uh you know rep- issues of representation all these different things and i think that they're they're related but they're not um they're not um they're not synonymous to me. And, and they're, so, often, they're yeah. often in tension though, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, any sort of institution has a set of, you know, requirements. I mean, we, we both teach, you know, and we're yeah. kind of, we're talking, we're often talking about this transgressive artistic material in the context of, of, a, yeah. of a classroom or, you know, or here we are in the context of a, <laughs> of a museum and you have to hold a space open that, you know, is, is, is safe in some way and is 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 open yeah. for participation yeah. and that's often yeah. the re- institutional requirements are not the same as a as a as a, as yeah. a sort of artist as a artistic requirements i mean it, it's yeah yeah. You know, you 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 kind of say at various points that that you you're, you're I mean you're suspicious of 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 art that, of trying to reduce art to the therapy the, the, the therapeutic or the ethical mm-hmm. or the political. Um, mm-hmm. But you don't. I mean, you don't seem like you're kind of traditionally going for an art for art's sake. Mm-hmm. The artist is free to is beyond the is beyond the uh, the norms of, of, of ordinary society. So kind of, we're, say, yeah, say more about that because- Say more about that, right? Yeah. yeah. Say some I, stuff. I think you've really, I think you've really, you know, you, I, I haven't thought it fully through and I didn't end up writing about it, but I actually am really interested. I mean, I, I wrote about it a little bit in the book, but I am really interested in this idea about, you know, where art, lives because as you say so much of nearly everything we experience it's like I'm teaching a book or it's something is on the wall of a museum and as you say these spaces are institutionally um, uh, regulated and and yet so much of the work that we make and that we value and that we um, you know is not it, it, it is made if not intention if outright um uh you know chaotic defiance of of the of the desire to be um you know regulated and and so there's um i mean not all, not all art stems from that principle but there is i mean we talked about this in our last conversation because red pill is just to me this amazing allegory about creation and surveillance and you know the, the the writer going to try and write and finding it endlessly surveilled and then kind of crushing out on the libidinal in this case right wing figure I don't know there's, there's a lot going on there that's interesting to me but I think that in my book there's a quote that I draw on from um, the Buddhist teacher Pima Chodron who's describing um, some of the difficulty of some of uh, where she says the environment was safe, meaning like the, the Buddhist retreat. You know, so the environment was safe, but the teachings were threatening. Mm-hmm. And I think that that is, you know, I kind of pull out that line is it feels very familiar to me, you know, um, in teaching. And then there's kind of this question of like, well, should, should the teachings too become less threatening, you know, to like, um, but it's the, it's the tension between those two things that can be, you know, so interesting. And then also, like I say, where does art live? Like art also lives places where, you know, you know, we, you know, where are we, where are we free to create, you know, in our own homes and what countries, uh, where does, where can our work circulate? I mean, you've written a lot too about, um, whether it's Rushdie or, you know, Hebdo or different things. Like, I mean, it, it really, I mean, talk about subjugation or domination and freedom from freedom to it. It really is obviously very dependent upon circumstance. But I think, um, yeah, I'm just very alive to and interested in those questions, you know. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we have this discourse around artistic freedom and 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 the sort of responsibility of the artist to, uh, to not harm Mm-hmm. Uh, at, at the moment, I mean, and you you mm-hmm. you revisit a couple of of uh, of, of sort of well known examples of that, but you you know you say something that I think is is um, you know is 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 confronting for for people right now, which is you know you say refusing to take up the burden of how one's art may make innumerable heterogeneous, essentially uncontrollable others feel 
does not to me signify ethical failure. It may in fact signify sane boundaries in a world dedicated to their erosion. Mm -hmm. um, is that the same as saying that the artist has, you know, you know I'm, I must be true to my art and I'm, you know, fuck your feelings. I mean, is it what, you know, is the, how is this different from a Trumpian disinhibition? Well, I think in that part you're pulling out of my book, it, I'm talking about questions of scale, you know, and I think that we are living at a moment with scales, whether it's everything from social media to climate change, that I feel some compassion for us in terms of our difficulty. And I don't, I don't know that the human body or psyche is is quite matched for some of the scales that we encounter. And I think it is partly why people in my two cent psychoanalysis that no one's asked for is, you know, why, why a lot of people don't feel well, you know? And I, and I think that, that in part it don't feel well because of like a scale sickness, because when the scale gets off, um, like if you're trying to just care for, you know, your kid who's pissed at you that day, um, you know, or somebody else who's angry that you cut them off and, you know, while driving or whatever you're trying to deal with, like the scale that, you know, um, you know, 4,024 people, whatever, have like, you know, told you what they think of some post you put up. I just think it's very difficult. I mean, I, you know, that, that the, the, the economy of care and how to distribute it and how to, and how to figure out what, um, you know, That's, ethics, I mean, it's the practice of ethics, what things demand your care, you know, and absolutely. what kind of care will they demand? And I think it makes people feel impotent and paralyzed on the level of climate change and other things when the scale, uh, when, when, the, when they don't, when they're, when, it, when when we become too bewildered as how to meet out our care and attention, you know. That's a very interesting thing. I mean, I've been reading the philosopher Timothy Morton, who were talking mm -hmm. about hyper objects, mm -hmm. these yeah. uh, these you know, things like the climate that yeah. we you know, are so vast that we're unable to kind of you know see all around them, but we experience their effects. But they're sort yeah. of so much beyond human scale. And I hadn't really thought about that that social media in in those terms. In that there mm -hmm. is this impossibility of of handling the response. If it, you know, if you, you mm -hmm. say something on the internet. And and the internet, you know, decides to be interested in it and perhaps angry with you for for, for doing it. Um, there is an impossibility. You, don't, you just simply it's not human scale anymore. Things run away from it, and and I think that that feeling of dis hyphen ease that you talk about unease that you talk about is 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 absolutely recognizable as an attempt to deal with scale. I think that's such an interesting thought and you know who knows about the hyper object of the internet are the people like you know the jack dorsey's of the world like they 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 see the the hyper object you know we we see our like daily you know psychic screw rounds you know what i mean and i, and I think mm -hmm. it's important to recognize that you know I mean, let's let, let's 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 circle back to, to Buddhism again because I mean, you 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 said uh, in, you know in the context of 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 teaching. I mean, that's such an interesting thought again. The mm -hmm. the dangerous the dangerous teachings in the safe mm -hmm. space. I mean, I, I feel that that's a sort of ideal for me as a as a teacher, being able to bring the hard questions in in a, in a in a in a in a in a place where we we actually have a space to discuss that, mm -hmm. but the question I have for you, Sadie, is, is is about something else. Is that um, in a in a Christian tradition? I mean, this is a very broad brush thing, but let's say that freedom might look like complete self realization or like mm -hmm. actualization of mm -hmm. of the self, mm -hmm. and a fulfilling potential. Whereas Buddhism is all about the uh, the escape from self or the dismantling of the illusion of self as as the route to 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 freedom. I mean, those are very very different thoughts. And clearly, you know, you have an interest in and exposure to Buddhist teachings. I wonder if you could say some more of, about Buddhism and, and 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 human freedom. Boy, I mean, you know, I'm I'm a super lay person uh, and just an an interested intellectual in spiritual traditions, you know, than anything else. But I think it goes back to, in part, what we were talking about at the beginning about um, freedom and care and about self and other. <laughs> and when I said that I thought 
the enmeshment was like the ground, you know, and that, 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 that that's also just another way of saying that the distinction between self and other, um, it, you know, can be an illusion, you know, not, not to say that we don't experience our lives as individuated bodies or minds, but that, you know, the hyper object, as it were, um, may be um, something else, you know, um, that's that's not always um, uh, palpable to us and it's non-palpability causes suffering, you know. Mm-hmm. And so in some ways, um, finding aspects to, as you say, kind of undo that or reveal other, you know, a, a, a different kind of, it's not even a relation, it's, it's like a... Um, uh, it's not even an interpenetration. It's like more than that. I don't know what you want to call it. Like, um, I, I think that that, yeah, I mean that I'm, 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 I'm super interested in that idea. And I'm also interested in how, um, uh, I don't know how to say it. Like part of staying with the trouble or like reckoning with pain is the way that like our pain and suffering, like it, it, it's a lot of times because we are like, if you think about physical pain, you, you, as a friend of mine once said, I, you know, I hate it because it makes me, me, like it takes me away from being with others. Like when I'm in pain, I just keep thinking about myself and thinking about, you know, <laughs> this part of my body over and over again, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts. And it's like, I was fascinated by this idea of like pain as an individuating <laughs> thing. Mm. Um, and the ways then that I think, you know, near the end of my book, I'm trying out different ideas of the way that, you know, that the way that, I don't know how to say it, like the way that, that, that connecting with others, and by others, I don't just mean other people, you know, um, can, um, you know, can be, uh, can, can be a mitigating force on our suffering, you know. I mean, yeah, I mean, the idea of that, that kind of freedom is freedom to be in relation to others, like if you're exactly. freedom from your yeah. pain, from your, you know, yeah. isolation and, 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 and uh, individuation would be, would be, would be a kind of, you know, a going forth into a freedom, which is a sort of communal space. And that, well, that's that, a great benefit of the fact that it's not denying reality. <laughs> You know, yes. which, which there is, I think, a lot of freedom. Like when I wrote the climate chapter, I remember a friend of mine said, kind of jokingly, they were like, so do you feel better or worse about the climate? You know, I said, I said, oh, I feel a lot worse. <laughs> I said, but I feel a lot better generally because I feel like I, I know what's going, like I know, I, I, I feel like, I, I feel like I took enough time to be like in touch with the real and like there's a great freedom and pleasure in that where you're just not running anymore (laughs) you're just not running from the thing which is the real you know i mean the climate the climate chapter is where you deal with with the notion of the future and 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 whether that's you know whether our future is a constraint or 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 or, you know or an open space of of possibility and and um you know i'm i'm i mean there are all sorts of things in there but i'm i'm I know I double underlined the your your mm. observation that you can't really write unless you have some sort of investment in in futurity mm-hmm. in the future. I mean, I, what do you I, think? I, do you believe it? <laughs> no, I know I do absolutely because I you know I, I I think unless you have some expectation at some point in the future there will be a reader mm-hmm. who will read what you like what you write in a very very basic way you cannot mm-hmm. actually bring yourself to 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 mm-hmm. tighten the keyboard because there is no point i mean in those in those bleak moods where you know where i'm you know depressed or whatever it is that that where i i can't envisage that future and the pleasure of addressing or in some way projecting myself forth into that future then then you know writing becomes a completely kind of pointless thing mm-hmm. and of course the other thing is 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 we're both both of us are parents and mm-hmm. that gives us a particular relationship to futurity mm-hmm. and to our own decision to 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 have to have children um i mean you write in a in a let's say a disabused way about freedom and care and uh, 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 and being and being a parent you know you're 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 in no way trying to trying to pretend that the kinds of constraints that come along with parenting don't exist but 
could you, yeah, could you say a little bit more about the relationship that you now have with Futurity, thinking about your your children and the climate and uh, your your optimistic decision to, to reproduce? <laughs> You have always like there's so many things I think I'm going to respond to. Then your final question, I'm like, oh God, I'll I'll know no, about I that. I mean, for, uh, I'm just sort of offering. <laughs> no, consider me like offering you a sort of I, I don't know a box of a box of chocolates. Pick what you would but like. You are <laughs> and and you are is the thing. I'm um, I'm interested in well, like I guess my first thought was interested in what you were saying about parenting and freedom and constraint and I think that I don't know I pass this along in, in case it helps anybody else but I think that like um that feeling like that, that that push and pull between like I can't do this for another minute and need to be alone and then the minute or the next hour that like you're alone you just think what are my kids doing? I miss them so much. Like that, when a friend once told me, they were like, oh, welcome to it. That's the whole, that that, that seesaw is the whole thing. Like it's never going to end, you know? And I think again, with the kind of like real, like kind of when I, when you recognize that that's the, that's the staying with the trouble, there is no out of that trouble. And the relationship is going to bring you, you know, untold joys and griefs. Um, but that when you know that that back and forth between um, the pleasures of care, the pleasures of constraint, and the pleasures of the kind of, um, you know, I don't know what I would say about freedom. I guess I would just say, um, you know, you know, it's like one of the best things in life. So, you know, and and so um, whatever relation to feeling good that that has, I mean, I think we talked about Actually, I don't think I talked about, I was looking at the questions I had for you last time we talked and my last one was about children in futurity. Um, and I think that I, you had this quote where you, in an interview, said you were alarmed but determined, you know, about the future, <laughs> which I wrote down in large letters because I think that, that um, you know, I share that feeling, alarmed but determined. And I, I feel like there is a kind of, um, the sentiment at the end of my book uh, or at the end of the climate chapter, I mean, that actually, since you've been reading Morton, you know, will be um, familiar to you, but I'll just read the last line of the chapter, which says, um, Morton says he wants to awaken us from the dream that the world is about to end because action on earth, the real earth depends on it. And I say, for so long, I didn't know what he meant. I do now. And I think that, change from the dream that the world's about to end, which can be so, you know, intoxicating as it's horrifying and alarming because action on earth, the real earth depends on the giving up of that dream. You know, to me that, that is a gift of parenting and it's, um, but I think it's available to anybody. And I think it allows one to be more alarmed, but determined um, and to believe in the powers of amelioration and mitigation, as opposed to just these poles of doomed, not doomed, which are at this point not going to be helpful. You know, I mean that's what's so sinister about the current space race. To me, I was watching Jeff oh, yeah. talk about about you know a future in the off-world colonies, um, and yeah. you know suddenly it dawned on me that he wasn't intending to leave; he was intending for us to leave. <laughs> um, that. that um, that this kind of maintenance of the of the planet was going to, you know, the planet was going to become a kind of gated community right. while the rest of us yeah. sort of slaved. I wonder who will be left to do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, this this idea of, you know, e exit as freedom, yeah. I mean, I mean, it, yeah. it, 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 it circulates on the yeah. right a lot, as a lot of um, a lot of people on the right got yeah. interested in um, yeah. the Albert Hirschman's exit voice and loyalty and the idea of a kind, you know, if you don't yeah. like something, you leave. Yeah. Um, you know, that's that seems to me a kind of particularly sort of sinister set of options in that in that it does it does hold forth the the, the notion of 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 the of an elite who then kind of separate themselves out from the yeah. from this this work of of, of, of maintenance yeah. and, and and care mm -hmm. um i haven't really got a question to do that I'm, we've been going for an hour and a bit yeah. i think i should probably open the q a box and yeah, see yeah yeah, yeah. yeah let's do that and i'll just say that yeah all that stuff is super interesting to me and i think that um you know in 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 the I guess it's the climate chapter, you know, I kind of rehearsed this divide that Bruno Latour has laid out that about kind of 
earlier formulations about the left or the right or other things not not being as compelling to him as this uh, uh, differential between, you know, what he calls the out of this worlders, which is what you're describing, the exit, you know, call it, call it Brexit, call it Bezos space, whatever you want to call it, this idea that, you know, as Latour says, you know, we'll, we'll shed the burdens of solidarity as quickly as possible and, you know, escape to the, you know, I don't know, like your ranch in New Zealand or your terrarium on Mars, wherever you're imagining this, this grand new unencumbered, unburdened, unenmeshed life to be, which of course, again, doesn't, doesn't exist, um, versus what he calls, you know, down to earth, uh, you know, the terrestrial. And I think that, um, you know, for those of us who think that life on earth is pretty great and the earth is pretty amazing, you know, this idea that the terrestrial is in some ways, uh, you know, the inferior option is just like pure insanity. And I, there was actually a really great article I read the other day. I, I'll look for it. I wish I had it, but it was, um, you know, uh, I think by somebody who was a spouse of uh, uh, someone in NASA, but just writing about the thousands of people on Earth it takes to keep one astronaut alive for like a 24-hour period <laughs> and just saying like, if you think there isn't a, the, you know, the largest team of interrelation trying to keep this one person in a suit from not dying for, you know, a short period of time, you have another thing to learn about how the International Space Station or spacewalks work. And I, I think it was such a great article because it just really, you know, just really underscored the the the, the phantasmagorical nature of the exit, um, and yeah, which isn't to say it doesn't have strong psychic grip and isn't having real uh, political um, uh, consequences. You know, I, I'm, I'm not. I don't diminish. I don't diminish, as you say. You keep calling it sinister. I don't diminish what it, I don't diminish the harm it can do on you know to Earth and on Earth. You know. I mean, there was a sort of comic inflection with that. I read an, uh, an essay yesterday or an, an account of some um, crypto guys who who bought themselves a cruise ship, this sort of seasteading idea. You know, they were trying to get their seasteading pods together, but in the meantime, they thought they'd have a ship that would be the good ship crypto. Right, right, right. Satoshi and it was gonna it was gonna be moored in international waters and it was gonna be great. And the various ways in which they found themselves enmeshed in, in not just sort of right. regulatory issues, but just sort of very, very practical things about like kind of what you do with the waste right. and stuff. Right. And it was yeah. it was a, it was yeah. really interesting kind of I mean they you know all, all power to them for trying out their thought experiment and then bumping up against the the real in in, in that way. Um, so what have we got? What have we got from the audience? Is a, I mean, a straightforward one. Is why do you refer to the four sections of your book as songs? In what sense are they? Uh -huh. songs? That's funny because I, you know, it's kind of like a joke with myself that I, I think it's been lost on some other people. <laughs> in, in so far as that, like, um, you know, I am somebody who's done more lyric forms of writing than this book, and um, I don't uh, I, like. I don't. I don't, it's not lost on me that these are not the most lyric of my writing. They're less song-like than your other, some of your other texts. You know, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm fully aware that they're less song-like, you know, that they're kind of, you know, they're, they're, they're lengthy, belabored, kind of mini book chapters. Um, uh, but I thought it was, uh, I thought it was amusing to call them songs because um, I... I have a line in the drug chapter, which we haven't really talked about, but in the chapter on drugs, I talk about Avital Ronell's book, Crack Wars, and I say it was the first book to teach me that literary, that theorizing could be a literary act, you know? And I think that I I, I, I still do think of, of, of all of my books, maybe with the exception of one, which was my dissertation <laughs> turned into a book, but the rest of them I think of as literary acts. Um, and, and, and literary performances with, uh, uh, pitched towards various idioms, you know, and this one's exactly. obviously pitched more towards the scholarly, but I think of it um, as employing a lot of things that I know from different spheres. So anyway, part of it was kind of a joke, that, but that not really a joke that tethered it to uh, my other work. And then part of it was also that, um, uh, I don't know, that I was listening to certain... Um, uh, you know, multi-symphonic uh, music, like, you know, pop music, but like things that I, I thought I was really interested in how, 
because I felt like this was my problem in this book, which was kind of how do I find the tone of this song by virtue of having like many movements, like, like kind of like marshalling, like these like mini symphony, like mini, the chapters are organized by these um, kind of 18th century subtitles. And like, I think I thought of this movements. And then also I just have all these voices, like a lot of people talking, talking, talking. And I, and it, and it really felt like a form of sampling, but then the kind of formal question is like, how is this not just a sampling? You know, how do you make it your song? You know, and I and given that that was the formal problem to me, and given that I have a long history of always naming books with a subtitle that names the formal problem, um, mm-hmm. that was the one that occurred to me here. Good answer. I, that was oh, that, that was like way <laughs> deeper than I thought we were going to go with that. You feel like chapters was too boring. Next, okay. <laughs> Um, well, we've got some good questions here. So, um, um, Steph Smith says, as an academic recent MFA graduate, lifelong feminist, I've got recently undergone a very curious return to faith. Um, um, I've never previously held much faith for anything outside my political ideals and social ethic. I mean, could you speak to this kind of freedom, the freedom of extreme personal mutability? Um, and perhaps even the freedom to practice one's faith in and then in arenas, uh, it has seemingly been evacuated from. And is, is you know is, is 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 the relationship between faith and freedom something that you you find a useful frame? Or you... God, I would love to sit down and uh, talk to you, questioner, about this for a long time because it sounds like you have an interesting story to tell, and I would like to hear it. Um, but given the confines of our Zoom conversation, and given that I would, you know, in the Wittgensteinian me wants to know what you, what you, what, what faith means to you, you know, as a concept before I would go into it. But I would say that I do think this book has a. Um, uh, I mean, you mentioned Bahari before this uh, conflict that uh, that I revisit via Arendt with her distaste for spiritual freedom. And her, um, you know, true belief that you know, without politi- that the, the inner freedom or spiritual freedom is like a, it's like a booby prize for the powerless. Like it's like it's all you've got when you have nothing, but it doesn't. It's not really freedom, you know. And I think that I was very interested in comparing, um, as historically was the case with uh, Arendt and Baldwin and other places. James Baldwin kind of going head to head, where he's where he says. Um, you know, uh, the political state of a nation is um, uh, controlled and menaced by its spiritual state. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I was really interested in, in kind of getting beyond this idea of like, of a rent that spiritual freedom is just, a, you know, a meaningless thing. We only should talk about political freedom, while also being not so interested in this idea that spiritual freedom is, you know, all that matters. And that there is this, and that there's this interpenetration, like that Baldwin lays out, you know, about, I mean, you can't, as I say in the book, you can't chart it, you can't see it, but we know it. I mean, we feel that our nation is menaced and controlled by its spiritual state. I think we know, I, I, I feel like I know that, I feel it. And anyway, and the book also does have a lot about, especially in the drug chapter, about kind of experiences of um, sub- submission or, you um, uh, revelation uh, in ways um, that I think are that anyway. That I'd love to sit down and talk to you in a different form about. But there's a there's a drug question here from Tim Looney. He says I'm curious about the relationship between freedom and dependency. What does freedom look like for someone who's dependent upon pharmaceuticals to live while living within a society that doesn't consider healthcare a human right? Um, I mean, obviously, yeah, I mean, addiction is, you know, we think of addiction as being the paradigmatic unfree yeah. state, yeah. I guess. Yeah, as I say in the start of the drug chapter, you know, the, the which I didn't know before starting to write, but that the, the etymological root of addiction, addictus, is um, to, to give over, to surrender, also to be made a slave, you know, it's totally, totally fascinating. And so um, I don't know quite, I'd have to, Again, I wish we were at like a Q&A in person where I could ask you and you could say more about what you mean about um, pharmaceuticals and the relationship about health and you know, about, you know, the tragedy of, of health care. Um, but I would just say that um, 
the whole drug chapter is really fascinated by um, the um, the. I don't know the, the the knot of how of how substances that make us feel free, and I don't discount that they do make us feel forms of freedom. Um, um, and not all drugs, you know. Obviously, people and people have told me, and I know this. People have said, you know, what about you know microdosing? What about you know psilocybin? Like I, I'm not. Th- th- this book is. I mean, this chapter is very focused on drugs that are addict. You know, that are addictive, where that people f- suffer from. Um, but as I say in the opening, you know, there's a kind of um, you know, this fascinating dialectic between um, that develops, you know, kind of in through, through through an addiction where where one's, you know, continuing to chase the feeling of feeling free or relieved or unburdened, um, while also knowing that the same action is it is literally the, the burdening, you know, and that that um, becomes very difficult to figure out how to how to cut the knot, you know. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole other kind of yeah drug chapter to be written about. Yeah. I suppose psychedelics mainly yeah. as a, as 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 a kind of uh, uh, yeah. I mean, as you know, the freedom yeah. to alter your to alter your brain chemistry, the freedom to have certain yeah. forms of experience that are not the form. Yeah, I mean, this chapter is very like I was very aware while I was writing it that there were kind of two big drug discourses going on around me, both of which I kind of ignored in the chapter but they were but they were infusing my thinking like when well, one is about the opioid crisis right and is about and is about pharmaceuticals and it's about opioids in particular and about the notion of the painkiller right and the and the and the 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 toll and the travesty um that 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 the opioid epidemic has taken and then the other discourse of course is a kind of you know michael pollan you know other people discourse about the and, and all this new research into the relationship between um uh, uh, psychedelic drugs and and trauma treatment, um, PTSD, all kinds of things, um, and you know, and and is obviously much more optimistic. And but there are also different drugs, you know. And the chapter is alive to the fact that um, you know drugs is a is a is an invented category to which we and we apply to a variety of. Um, chemicals or plants. It's not, it's a juridical category. It's not a natural category. So I think, um, you know, my chapter is fast and loose, but it's definitely weighted towards, like I say, um, addictive drugs. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I mean, there's, there's a whole bunch more questions, but I feel where is is there, is there, a, a, a you, have you got the, the, the chat? The Q&A, let me the pull Q&A it up. open. Is there something you'd like to look up for maybe a last a last question you'd like to answer something particular. Let me see. These are all great. I feel like yeah, yeah, yeah. my goodness. All right, let's see. Um, okay, to Terry, I just want to say that I just gave a big plug for Carlo Ravelli's. Uh, <laughs> book about time okay um and i'll give another one here let's see um let's see um oh my gosh there's so many of these that are so great um you can the easy ones like you've, you are you are you going to publish any more poetry in the oh gosh all right that, that that wasn't an easy one um <laughs> is that just taking you to okay. a bad place yeah i don't know i mean i'm really <laughs> interested i mean i'm interested in how books um I mean, I've noticed this in the novels of years I've read Hari too, but like, you know, I think that for most writers, one one book, you know, things birth the others in terms either unfinished business or in, in like a self-reactionary way where you're like, never doing that again. <laughs> like, and you or you want to do something totally else, you know. And I'm always holding out like lyric poetry as like, I'm just gonna stop writing all these nonfiction books that say things and I'm just gonna write poems again, <laughs> you know, that say things too, but say things, you know, much more slant. Um, or as Robert Creeley once said, you know, they say things really specific about your mental landscape. It's just not like saying I have to go to the bathroom or I'll be back in five minutes, but I'm like locked into this universe right now. I have to go to the bathroom, I'll be back in five minutes. And I definitely crave liberation from it. But I feel like there are certain impulses in my own writing life that have to be very, um, 
Well, all, well, all of it. It just has to be very, it has to, you know, you know, as I'm fond of telling my students, it's not like you have a smorgasbord of choices from which you're like, I think I'll choose this project. You know, you have to just choose the the the, the, the genre or the impulse or the thing. You just have to like follow your intuition and, and it's not, you know, it's not, um, and I don't think I could decide to write lyric poetry if I tried, you know. Uh-huh. Um, just in just just for you know so you know if it if it is the thing next it would be um uh and then i guess the only one i would answer just maybe in closing is just kind of how these four chapters um came about these four subjects and um you know the art and sex chapters were more like um trod territory in a certain way for me, like extensions of things about feminism and about queer theory and about, um, you know, living as a, as a, as a maker in an art, in the art world. Um, and that, and, um, and being an art lover and being, a, a teaching in art school, you know, that those things were more, um, swift to mind, but I, I, I wanted to write actually, I'd, I'd wanted to write the drug chapter, which is, you know, arguably by far the most obtuse, but I actually wanted to write that chapter before I almost wanted to write any of them. I was really fascinated by, um, you know, and often thought maybe I just wanted to write a little book about drugs, but then it really seemed like there was some kernel, and I guess I, since I haven't said this, I'll just say it because I think it's important to the book, like there was some kernel in the drug thing, which is about people not just wanting to be sovereign subjects in control of themselves, you know, that I think makes political discourse really confusing if we think, why don't people just act in their best interest of wanting to self-govern and be free sovereign subjects? So people just don't, that's not who we are, in my opinion. You know, we have a lot moving through us. And as I say in that chapter, the drug drive tells us otherwise. The drug drive tells us a lot of things, you know, a lot of it's really really bad news sometimes and sometimes it's not yeah go but ahead. also yeah i mean get it i mean we want to get messed up we want to yeah. we want to we want to break ourselves open as a way of being free rather than i mean yeah. really from from that sovereignty i mean the yeah. oppressive requirement to govern ourselves exactly which is why, of, of, of why sex, we yeah why we take drugs yeah and that's why in the sex chapter too i talk about a lot about how the discourse like you were saying about ethical sex unfortunately you know, engages, I'm not saying it shouldn't, I'm just saying it's difficult and that it engages a lot of ideas about a self-mastered subject about an activity that many people go to, to experience feelings of unmastery. And and, and that produces a lot of trouble. Um, anyway, so I knew I wanted to write the drug thing and then the climate thing, I just, um, you know, it was, it, it required the most research like out of my field, but I felt like, you know, truly compelled to do it um, and truly compelled to to really spend the time um, and and probably learn the most writing that chapter than any of the other ones. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe that's the place that we should we should end it then. Thanks, yeah. Maggie. That was so Sorry, thank you so much. Good. Thank you so much. Let's talk again. Complete pleasure. Oh, I'm sure we will. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Both so much. I'm so so grateful. Thank you, Maggie, for letting us. Uh, premiere your book and thank you to all of you in the audience for coming. I'm hoping that somebody starts a book club uh, because I'm dying to join a book club so that I can really get into the nitty gritty of the topics raised by this amazing new book by Maggie Nelson. Um, So feel free to purchase a copy from the Hammer store. There's a link in the chat or at your favorite local neighborhood independent bookstore. And thank you all so much for coming and have a wonderful night. Goodbye.